Hi everyone, I'm recording this video because many of you asked me about this specific topic. How many layers or how many hidden layers do you need in your artificial neural network and how many neurons? Well, I'd be very surprised if anyone has a definitive answer to you, but let's actually have a quick look at the artificial neural network and see if we can even predict or if we can come up with certain guidelines that help us define the number of layers. So starting with looking at the linear equation. Again, I'm doing this one more time because I did this in the last video because we all understand linear equation. It's just a bunch of x values and then y values and we fit it to a straight line. And what is a straight line? The equation is given by ry on the y-axis equals to mx you can do, use ax if you want, but whatever that value is, you're multiplying your x with, that is the slope of your straight line, plus b or plus c, whatever that constant value, that is the intercept, right? So this is how you define a straight line. So, uh, but if you have multiple independent variables, meaning you have x1, x2, x3, x4, then you can come up with y equals to uh, you know, uh, m1 x1 plus m2 x2. In this equation, I use the term beta. So y equals to beta1 x1 plus beta2 x2 plus so on, uh, and then a constant value of beta naught or beta zero. For machine learning purposes, again, we use the term bias. So think of this as a bias and all of these slopes, okay, as weights. So the multipliers to your x values as weights. Again, we looked at this in the last tutorial. If uh, you look at the artificial neural network, this is a very simple case. Again, I explained this in the last tutorial. So you have an input uh, layer where in this example, we have two inputs going in and then one output coming out, okay? And uh, in this example, we have one hidden layer. And again, I talked about all the weights and all that, but uh, uh, so please watch the previous tutorial. But we are going to talk about this uh, uh, one more time, but in a, a bit simpler manner. Now let's remove the hidden layer. What happens if we have no hidden layers? Okay, so the question here is how many hidden layers do we need? But what happens if we remove a hidden layer? We just have input and output. Okay, so if that's the case, this is how the neuron looks like, the neural network looks like, right? So you have two inputs and you have an output. Again, you have uh, the weight that the input values are multiplied with. I am calling it W0 and W1. Okay, so wait for our input one, wait for input two. Going back, sorry, going back, exactly the same thing here, okay? You have X1, X2, wait beta one, beta two. I should have used the same beta terminology, but Okay, I'm using W right now, okay? And then in addition, we have bias. So how is our output defined? Our output is basically our bias plus your input value X0 multiplied by the weight plus X1 multiplied by W1, right? So this is how the output is. And then the output goes through, or this neuron typically goes through an activation function like ReLU or something, but uh, the, in the output layer, you don't apply a activation, which means the default activation is a linear activation. So input equals to output, okay? So that's what the activation is. So for now, let's not worry about activation because it's just linear. So if you look at this equation, it looks exactly like the equation that we just saw a slide ago, right? So the point I'm trying to make with this slide is, with no hidden layers, your neural network is basically a linear equation. So it's like doing linear regression, okay? So now you can see, if your problem can be solved using linear fitting, then you don't need any hidden layers, okay? So that's uh, the point. So let's have a look at the code, okay? I'll share the code and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll enjoy looking at this code because at the end of it, hopefully we'll prove that this is uh, same as linear regression. So let me increase the output size there. Okay, so let's start with linear regression and the problem I'm trying to look at here is hard data, right? I mean, this is the one I've used a few times and if you, I encourage you to watch my videos, so you know uh, you have a context you know when you're when you're watching any of these videos okay so the hard data is uh, just go ahead and uh, google search for hard disease data set and i'll put a link you know to this data set uh, uh, in the in the description but uh, if you look at this this is uh, we can drop the first column which is just an id the second column is the amount of biking someone does and the amount of smoking someone does and then finally the risk of heart disease 
yeah so let's see first of all can this be uh, you know fitted with a linear equation i've already done this in the past so if you have watched my previous video you know that yes we can use linear regression so let's do that and uh, let's uh, have a look at how actually let's run that and then let's run this so let's look at biking versus smoking so if i go to plots here is the biking obviously the more you bike the less risk of heart disease you have so uh, that is very linear so we can actually fit this with linear and how about the second variable this is our x1 right so what is our x2 so this also can be represented using linear in a way okay so let's actually go ahead and try our linear regression right here so again i'm not going to so all i'm trying to do here is define my x as uh, uh, every column you know smoking and uh, uh, biking by dropping the heart disease and my y is heart disease this is a regression problem we are trying to quantify the risk of heart disease as a number that ranges from i don't know zero to whatever the high limit is over there now our x values uh, again uh, are slightly different between smoking and if i go back you know they range from zero to 20 for uh, for smoking and they range from zero to okay maybe we don't have to normalize but it's always a good practice to normalize your x values and i'm using min max scalar so the values go between zero uh, where is my x zero to one instead of zero to 20 so they're all normalized this can be very useful if you have values that range quite a bit Okay, and uh, this part we know we are converting our data frame to NumPy um, array. Now I'm dividing my inputs into training and testing, so we can obviously print out uh, the the validation. Uh, you know, um, okay. So uh, linear model again. I've covered linear regression at least a couple of times in the past, so I'm just going to go ahead and run this. Okay. Now, linear regression is, again, uh, the way it works is it's trying to minimize the mean squared error. Okay, please keep uh, an, uh, uh, you know at least uh, note of this term mean squared error, right? This is the uh, error between the predicted and real values. You square it and then you add all and then you average it. That's why it's called mean squared error. So the algorithm is trying to minimize this leans, uh, this this least squares uh, mean squared error. Sorry about that. So uh, it's it's trying to minimize it. So if the error is the lowest, that's where the best fit is. Yeah, that's where the problem converges. Now, when I say the algorithm, what is it, what do I mean? What what is it trying to you know? Uh, how is it doing that? So linear regression actually uh, uses uh, ordinary least squares as optimizers. Okay, again, you can go ahead and read about it. It uses this, and in neural network, we can use you know Adam. Uh, RMSCs and you can use uh, a, a gradient descent and a whole bunch of other ones. Again, uh, a quick uh, relevant point right there. Okay, so we did uh, model. Now let's go ahead and fit the model and also print out the square, uh, I mean the, the score. And in this case, the score is 0 0.98, right? I mean, uh, if the score is one, that means it's a perfect fit. Okay, now 0 0.98 is a very good fit. And now let's go ahead and predict and report the mean squared error between the test data set and predicted data set. So the mean squared error seems to be 0 0.014667. Now, this is fine, but let's go ahead and print the model coefficient and intercept. And you know what I mean right here, right? I mean, coefficients are for the smoking, for, uh, for sorry, biking, the slope is negative, right? It's going down. So the slope is negative. So this minus 14.81 corresponds to the slope or the weight of biking. And the weight of smoking should be up, but it's not that steep. So that's why it's 5.244. And the intercept right here, or the uh, or the uh, bias, if you want to call it, is 14.88. As you can tell, this is between 17.5 and 7.5 right there, right? So this linear regression makes very nice logical sense because it's you can see it. Yeah, so you can see that the slope is negative here, the slope is positive here, and the intercepts also make sense. So this is what we get from linear regression. Okay, now let's quickly jump on to our neural network. I'm going to leave everything as is because all of this part, like handling the data and splitting it into uh, a training and testing data set is exactly same as linear regression. So I'm using exactly the same data set, except down here, 
I'm adding my calling my libraries for uh, for you know for my uh, neural network and I, I commented some of this code because I'm sharing it with you so you can experiment with these but what we are trying to look at right now is this part okay so first of all I'm uh, importing a optimizer called stochastic gradient descent this is where if you have like a, it's a optimization problem where it's trying to find the minimum by uh, gradient descent it's actually taking steps and then trying to see okay uh, uh, where can I find the minimum and once it finds the minimum that is the solution and uh, a total lecture can be on stochastic gradient descent because the learning rate if you change it you know the steps can be pretty large which means you may miss the actual uh, you know minimum but if the steps are too small like 0 0.0001 then it will definitely find the minimum but it takes a lot more time right so this is uh, again a quick summary of stochastic gradient descent as an optimizer but Again, you don't have to worry about it. I'm just using SGD as an optimizer because this is this is a very good one for linear regression type of problems. Okay, much better than Adam. Go ahead and try Adam, meaning type Adam right here and then see if it works. Okay, let's build our model. First of all, we are using the sequential method. There you go. We imported sequential for Keras dot models. That means if it's a uh, if it's a model simple enough where we can actually stack these layers, this can be a very nice way of doing it. Okay, so we are calling to sequential. So it it defines a model. Now to that model, I'm adding an input layer with a shape of what is my shape? X train dot shape. So if you look at my X train dot shape, a shape of two. Yeah, I'm looking at shape one, right? I mean. So the shape of two, that means I have two inputs. That's all I'm trying to say. You can just type two right there if you want. And then I'm adding a dense layer with just one node. This is exactly same as this image. So all I'm trying to do is define two inputs and then an output with one node. That's exactly what that part means. And finally, how do we want to compile this? Using mean squared error. This is exactly what we used for linear regression using mean squared error and optimizer is OPT uh, which is our stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate of 0.1. Now if you look here the optimizer I mentioned in linear model is ordinary least squares. I don't know I mean we can define it as a function and use that as an optimizer here I don't want to go through that exercise but stochastic gradient descent is fine. Uh, so let's go ahead and use that in model.summary. So let's go ahead and print all of this. I mean, print the summary so you can see the summary over here. So let's drag this. Okay, so this one only has one dense layer, uh, meaning there are zero hidden. There is one input, one output. What is my output? It has a shape of one. It's giving only one output. And there are three parameters that, it's, uh, uh, that are trainable. What are these three parameters? We know that, right? weight zero, weight one, and bias. These are the three parameters we are trying to uh, learn. This is exactly same as our linear equation. What are we trying to do here? Find out beta zero, beta one, and beta two in our example. Okay, I hope you're with me so far. If you think this is too simple, please move on to the next video and don't watch this anymore. But uh, this is really can be enlightening if you never uh, looked at this by equating it to linear equation. Okay, so now let's just do 50 epochs. I think that's more than enough for stochastic gradient descent. You'll realize that if you put uh, Adam as optimizer, it takes a lot more time. It'll probably converge, but it takes a lot more, like 500 epochs or something. But stochastic gradient, I mean, for this type of problem, uh, as a stochastic gradient descent is pretty good. Okay, so let's go ahead and fit it with our X train data, uh, training data, and uh, let's also use validation as test, you know, for our validation. So let us do, this should be pretty quick, actually. Okay, there you go, it's done. Okay, now, uh, if you want to print out, first of all, if you would like to look at how the loss curves look like, so if I go to plots, Okay, they seem to be converged. In fact, I probably just needed only 15 to 20 epochs, but that's okay. Uh, hopefully our problem is converged. These are excellent looking uh, loss curves. Again, please watch my previous tutorial on uh, the various ways your loss curves can look like, but this is not bad. Okay, so now let's go ahead and print our weights and biases, uh, at least define our weights and biases right there. In fact, I should have printed them, but that's fine. What did we get from 
I'm sorry about this. I should have been a bit more prepared. We got these values from before, right? So minus 14.8. In fact, let's go to variable explorer because we just printed weights and biases. Where is our weights? Our weights right there. So our weights are from our artificial neural network minus 14.8056. So that's our first uh, parameter. So now here we got minus 14.814, practically the same number, right? And uh, the other weight for the second uh, variable, 5.26, uh, here 5.24. Again, practically the same. And if you look at biases, it should be very similar. So if you go to biases, 14.8863, 14.88. So what we have proven here is that our, if you have a neural network with zero hidden layers, it's exactly linear uh, like linear regression. So you can actually work with zero hidden layers if the problem is solvable in a linear fashion. Now, let's move back to the presentation here because I have a few more slides that are relevant to the question that we are posing, which is, when do we need hidden layers? Well, if the problem is like this, we just looked at the code. We said no hidden layers. You do not need hidden layers if it's a straight line. Then why not just go ahead and use linear regression? Well, you can, but if you really would like to work with neural networks for any problem, then go ahead and just use no hidden layers. But if your data is not linear, but if it's actually spread in a very weird way, then linear is not going to work. This is exactly when you need hidden layers. Now the question is how many hidden layers do you need? Okay, so uh, the answer is whatever gives you the best fit. Well, that's, I know that's not a definitive answer. You need the just the right amount of hidden layers, but what happens if you increase the number of hidden layers? For example, I can tell that in this example, and also another example right here, I haven't talked about it, but there's a breast cancer data set, right? You have so many input parameters, and they're not linear all the time. So this, you absolutely need a hidden layer, and how many neurons? In the last tutorial, go ahead and look at the last tutorial. We decided that, okay, with four neurons, it's probably okay. But then if you actually do 16 neurons or so in one hidden layer, your, your loss curves look very good, okay? So this is how you kind of figure out exactly how many you need. But as a rule of thumb, you can definitely see that if you have way too many hidden layers, then you will solve the problem. I mean, you'll get excellent uh, validation for your training data, but when it comes to testing data or other data sets, then it would be, the result would not be as good. So that means uh, we are overfitting by adding these many uh, hidden layers and exactly we, prove, we have proven this point in our uh, last tutorial, okay? Where we looked at the loss curves and say, okay, our validation loss curve is going way higher compared to your training loss curve, so we are overfitting, so we do not need that many hidden layers. Okay, so now, uh, how many neurons? Okay, so we just talked about hidden layers, but how many neurons do you need? A very similar answer, actually, here. So, uh, oh, sorry, we are still talking about hidden layers. I'll get to neurons in a second. Uh, uh, I thought that said uh, uh, neurons, but anyway, let's answer this hidden layers question. Zero hidden layers, just like we saw, if the problem can be represented in a linear separable functions, meaning you have three, four, five multiple independent variables, all of uh, which can be linearly modeled with your output, then you do not need any hidden layers. But most problems are not that simple, which means one, you can approximate any function that contains a continuous mapping from one finite space to the other. Okay, so for example, if you have, uh, uh, if you plot your X and Y and you have one class clustered in the middle and the other class like a donut right around this middle thing, uh, you can actually use one hidden layer and get like very decent results from that, uh, from that type of data spread. Okay, now if you have things a bit more complicated, two is okay. They can represent any arbitrary decision boundary. So if you have like a very weird decision boundary between your clusters and you can actually draw it out, you know, uh, then uh, uh, with layers two, 
in your hidden layers, you know, uh, for your artificial neural network, you can actually get very, very decent uh, results with uh, uh, two of these hidden layers. I've seen some uh, online blogs where they actually draw some lines, you know, between these and they can tell, okay, you need two, you need three. I, I went through the exercise. In fact, I uh, went through that exercise in the last couple of days, hoping to show you, okay, this is a great way. Uh, but it, it, it failed on a couple of examples I tried. So I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to give you wrong information. So, but go ahead and read online blogs and see if that helped you. Okay, so do you ever need more than two? Uh, usually it leads to overfitting, but again, additional layers, if you have very complex representation, they can learn. But again, uh, this is like uh, decision trees with too many trees, too many nodes. Uh, you can easily go get into uh, an overfitting scenario. Okay, so please be careful. I have never, ever, ever, uh, you know, used more than two hidden layers. So one or two my suggestion. Now, a number of neurons in the hidden layers, again, very similar answer, which is like, okay, too few neurons means you'll have underfitting. Again, I think we saw this in the last tutorial where we looked at the loss curves with only like two neurons in the hidden layer. Um, so you, it leads to underfitting. And of course, too many means it leads to overfitting. It's just the opposite. And also too many means it's very slow uh, to train the network. Now, I scouted the world of the internet to come up with any guidelines for you. And I'm putting a few of these, which make logical sense, obviously. So you, after this, you may be like, okay, we already know that, that's fine. Okay, it's always good to reinforce the message that you already have. So to secure the ability of network to generalize, in fact, I copied and pasted this from online uh, uh, discussions, uh, but uh, you can see that these make logical sense, right? Uh, so you want the network to generalize. So the number of nodes has to be kept as low as possible. If you increase the number of nodes, the, it becomes overfitting. So it works on the training data, but on actual data, uh, it may not uh, work. That's what we are calling generalizing the, the uh, network. And the number of hidden uh, neurons should be between the size of input layer and the size of output layer, which does make sense. You know, the size of input versus the size of output, it should be uh, 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 between these two, but, uh, another place, again, I do not see any references to this. That's why it'd be nice to cite a, uh, a publication that actually did a scientific study. But again, as guidelines, they make uh, good sense. The number of hidden neurons should be two thirds the size of input layer, okay? Plus the size of output layer. Uh, so, and finally, the number of hidden neurons should be less than twice the size of input layer again. These are good guidelines, but my experience is the selection of architecture will come down to trial and error. And how do you do trial and error? Just like I showed you in the last tutorial. Okay, uh, look at the loss curves and the accuracy curves, mostly the loss for validation and training. Okay, and then make sure that you're not overfitting, you're not underfitting, that the uh, curves look, uh, curves look uh, uh, you know, good on the data set that you're working on and also shuffle the data set like a few times. So you get like a few randomly uh, distributed training data and then look at the results. And if the results look great on uh, all these shuffles, you know, because uh, when you do X train, what I'm trying to say here is when you go back to your, uh, when you go back to your, uh, you know, scikit-learn uh, model, you know, testing and training split, go ahead and change this random state to a bunch of other values and then look at your loss curves. And they, if they still look good, then you may have a robust model. Okay, I hope you really learned something from this tutorial. And in the next tutorial, let's cover a different topic. Until then, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel and watch my previous tutorial because it makes more sense uh, when you watch my future tutorials. Thank you very much.